Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. We've got a ton of stuff to get through in today's video, and we're going to focus primarily on graphics cards, starting out with the RX 6800 XT, specifically ray tracing results which have actually leaked courtesy of videocards.com. As always, I'll leave a link to their article in the video description. You can see the results on screen yourself right now. Sorry, that was terrible. But um, the results are interesting for numerous reasons. I won't read out all of them because you can just see them on screen. But the results are interesting because they are higher than what many would suspect the RX 6800 XT would be capable of. AMD are also going to be releasing a demo in the next day or two as well to show off the capabilities of the ray tracing performance of RDNA 2. However, looking at these results, they are indeed actually pretty darn high and actually would be much more competitive with Ampere than we've been led to believe. And the reason I find this particularly head scratching is it's actually higher than the results I've been hearing from people who have actually been testing the cards. And one of the common um, things I'm hearing from a couple of people who have been testing the cards, and obviously I can't reveal who those people are because they are breaking NDA from uh, sharing any information with me at all, but uh, I definitely know they have got the cards because they've sent photos to me of the GPUs. Um, and they've told me that the ray tracing a performance isn't just the only thing, but the actual quality of the ray tracing itself is not as good as Ampere. So my whole thing right now is, as always, wait until the independent reviews are published online. I am, however, quite happy about these AMD results. It's definitely good that the GPUs are capable of impressive performance, but um, I think just with any product launch, we need to wait for independent uh, reviewers to actually get hold of the cards, to put them through their paces and see what they're capable of. The ray tracing is the only real question for me right now on these GPUs. Rasterization performance is very impressive across the board, and as I've uh, reported numerous times now, the GPUs overclock ridiculously. I'm hearing from multiple sources that they hit over 2500 megahertz in clock frequency, which is absolutely ridiculous. And furthermore, unlike some architectures which doesn't really scale so well with high clock frequency, RDNA 2 does because of obviously the architectural decisions that AMD have made, for example, Infinity, uh, uh, Infinity Cache and all that other stuff that we've talked about two trillion times by now. So to me, it's going to be very interesting to see what actually these GPUs are capable of, especially with the um, upsampling technology that AMD are working on, which is, um, well, to be honest with you, I think going to be a requirement moving into the next generation of games. Games now are becoming so demanding to run, it's not really realistic to run a game at like ultra high frame rates at 4K with all of the bells and whistles at maximum. And this is, it doesn't matter to be honest if this is a console, it doesn't matter whether this is a high end GPU. Upsampling and smart usage of the rendering pipeline is going to be a critical component to fully leveraging uh, the next generation of games. And in my mind, if the number of pixels um, is just being upsampled, but the quality is indistinguishable, what does it really matter? So I'm really happy that AMD are working on upsampling technology. And I'm actually really excited to see what it's capable of from both a visual and a performance perspective. Keeping on the subject of AMD, although also spilling across to NVIDIA as well as Intel, there's an interesting update for SAM, Smart Access Memory. There's been a lot of discussion regarding SAM over, well, the last several days, particularly given NVIDIA themselves have released a statement to say that their GPUs are also capable of supporting SAM, and they went as far as to say that it's actually part of the PCIe spec. 
and speaking to an NVIDIA representative, they enforced this to me and said that uh, their solution is something that's being worked on and we won't have to wait too much longer. And also it would indeed work with Intel processors as well. And now AMD, as you probably guessed, has decided to respond to all of this. So I'm gonna read out their statement. As the only company offering high performance gaming CPUs and GPUs, AMD is in a unique position to deliver uh, incredible PC gaming experiences. With AMD Smart Access Memory, we have designed, optimized, and validated both hardware and software technologies with all combinations of the Ryzen 5000 series, RX 6000 series, and AMD 500 series motherboards, and the latest drivers and BIOSes at launch. We believe this pairing unlocks the maximum platform performance. Smart Access Memory is built on the features of the PCIe standard and firmware standards resizable bar and was developed through extensive validation and platform optimization. We welcome the opportunity to support other hardware vendors in their efforts as part of our ongoing commitment to using common and open standards to improve gaming experiences." End quote. So this is a very interesting situation because going into this, I think a lot of folks did have questions because having a proprietary technology which is locked into the AMD ecosystem did raise questions. It was a very non-AMD strategy. But with that said, given the motherboards from AMD, uh, the CPUs as well as the GPUs are all from the same company, it did make sense that they could all work together. But while I don't think AMD were necessarily implying that it was an exclusive technology, I do think that the messaging should have been a little different and said that they were the first to be able to offer this and uh, been a little more upfront, so to speak, that it is actually part of the PCIe spec. With that said, we don't know how long it's going to be until Intel are able to roll this out. We do know that uh, it is compatible with Z490, so we can presume that that does mean Comet Lake and not Rocket Lake. Uh, which would also mean that, of course, it works on PCIe Gen 3. And we also don't know how long it's going to be for NVIDIA to launch their drivers to fully take advantage of this stuff. So it could be that we're waiting 3, 4, 6, 12 months for AMD's competition to offer this. Now, I'm not saying that is the case. I'm just saying that it could be the case. And obviously, AMD's solution is basically good to go as is. And... While the performance advantage is not massive, it, of course, does depend upon the application and resolution and all of the other normal caveats, it is still a performance advantage. So, if you're looking to build a system right now and you do have the opportunity to pick up a Zen 3 processor and uh, you are considering an RX 6000 series, you can look at it as it's kind of like free performance now, which is, I guess, one way to look at it. Either way, it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes AMD's rivals to offer any comparable solution. But, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, competition is definitely starting to heat up. Speaking of competition, NVIDIA are putting out more competition in the shape of the RTX 3060 Ti. You can argue that this graphics card is one of the poorer kept secrets in recent GPU history. And, well, here we are with it. Again, we can uh, thank videocards.com for leaking the slide of the performance results of the RTX 3060 Ti. And you can see that according to AM, uh, NVIDIA, excuse me, not AMD, in uh, according to NVIDIA, we are looking at a GPU which actually outperforms the RTX 2080 Super and obviously drastically outperforms the RTX 2060 uh, uh, series of GPUs. Now, NVIDIA, as the time I'm uh, putting this out anyway, the prices don't seem to have leaked of this GPU. There doesn't seem to be any mention of it in the videocards.com article. However, looking at uh, a NVIDIA's past history of the pricing of uh, their SKUs in the 60 range, and also looking at the price of the RTX 3070, and also looking at the specifications, alleged specifications, obviously this has not been confirmed yet, uh, officially anyway, outside of um, this uh, series of information that videocards.com has leaked, we can probably guess that it's going to be high 300 US dollar mark or low 400 US dollar mark. 
I think it would be amazing if the card did retail at like three, four, nine US dollars, like 350 US dollars, but I don't think that's achievable with this silicon. I think that that would be um, not really something NVIDIA would aim at. If I had to guess, it's going to be like 379, 399. I'm guessing it's going to be more like 399. However, I'm happy to be wrong if it is cheaper. Um, to me, this card, if these performance figures are legitimate, because, well, A, they are a leak, and B, they are from NVIDIA's internal figures, yeah, so you need to take two pinches of salt rather than just one pinch of salt. But if they are legitimate and uh, reviewers actually find that these cards do perform as advertised for 399 ish that would be amazing. Um, I think they would be the MVP, honestly. And you can imagine games such as Death Stranding, Doom Eternal, um, Cyberpunk. Like, Cyberpunk would be an obvious card, uh, obvious uh, choice for this particular card. Uh, obviously, we don't know how demanding um, Cyberpunk is going to be, whether this card is going to be capable of, like, I don't know, 1440p or 1080p performance on Cyberpunk, although, of course, it would depend on how high you crank the settings. It's hard to imagine that Cyberpunk is going to be gentle on your system, let's just be really honest, but with DLSS and upsampling technology, then obviously it might be more feasible. There are a massive number of titles at the moment which are incredibly demanding on the PC. Obviously, you've got um, games such as Watch Dogs Legion, which is, well, just actually eats your GPU alive. Uh, fortunately, you've got DLSS, which does make it a little more achievable. Assassin's Creed as well is also super duper um super duper uh, demanding too, especially if you crank up all the settings. Weirdly enough, the anti-aliasing option on uh, Assassin's Creed actually has a big impact in performance, but uh, just the game in general, I don't think it's necessarily super well optimized, so it kind of feels like they've used a kind of older engine and just piled on technology and piled on technology, although it is utilizing uh, the DX12 API for uh, PCs. And yeah, I, I could be here for the next six months. So um, GPUs in the higher echelons, such as the 6800 XT, are super exciting. And obviously they help drive the uh, gaming industry forward on PC. But cards such as the 6700 series from AMD, which they haven't formally announced yet, although allegedly are going to ship with 12 gigabytes of RAM, and uh, cards such as the 3060, 3060 Ti, those to me are the cards which obviously are going to go to the masses, and you can see that from Steam hardware survey, uh, surveys, excuse me. So hopefully we will see um, a case of this being true, and that the cards put out a great amount of performance. And in the final piece of news today, I'd like to discuss console game prices, as actually almost simultaneously both Microsoft and Sony have issued statements, with the statement from Sony being from Jim Ryan, we'll get into that first. Jim Ryan has said that he does believe that the 70 US dollar, or 70 Great British Pounds, obviously with the pound we have the um, taxes added on, and obviously with US, well, you guys know how all that works, but... Um, he believes, that is Jim Ryan, that the price for the next generation uh, consoles uh, for what they're asking for first party games is very fair because of the experiences that these next generation titles can offer and obviously the additional work which is uh, required to actually craft those experiences. And Microsoft too, they've said very similar. They have said that they will be announcing the prices of uh, first-party games soon, again, citing things such as the additional work which is required for the next-generation experiences. Obviously, artists need to put a lot more time into crafting those ultra-high-resolution textures. Game worlds are larger than ever before. You've got much more advanced AI and all the characters and all of this other stuff, which obviously is you know, human time. It requires a long time to actually craft this. And while AI tools are starting to become more prevalent in game design, and that is just, for example, to help you sculpt things, or uh, in the case, for example, of UE5, although this is not AI, uh, in the case of UE5, you'll be able to use something like Nanite and Lumen, uh, obviously with Lumen being for the um, uh, lighting pipeline, and with Nanite too, it means you don't have to pre-bake things, it means you don't have to craft like a ton of different models with different LODs, it, you know, it, it just, it does simplify uh, the time of actual artists, 
But even so, this is something that is going to take a lot of time. But with that said, Microsoft doesn't seem to be so set on charging those prices for all games. It seems to be a little more open and said that it, def it, def it def does actually realize that, you know, price is a very sensitive issue. The other thing, too, of Microsoft, of course, is that you do have that tasty, tasty, tasty thing known as Game Pass, um, which does obviously make things a lot more palatable because you can just uh, cough up a monthly fee. Now, I imagine that the price of uh, titles is always going to be something that's very subjective. I put out a couple of polls on this. And some people are really happy to pay the extra price. They feel that it's okay. And others, of course, not so much. Especially if a game is, well, let's just face it, monetized with many different options like microtransactions. To be fair to Microsoft, especially Sony actually with first party titles, they don't really uh, add in a ton of different uh, monetization options. Spider-Man, Demon Souls and so on are not, you know, with a ton of different monetization uh, in game, which does obviously mean it doesn't feel like they're trying to nickel and dime you as you're continuing to play the title. Uh, but let me know your thoughts on this as well. Uh, how much you're willing to pay for first party games. Do you think that 70 US dollars, for example, is fair? And uh, what do you think of Microsoft also charging this going into the next generation? With all of that said, though, thank you very much for watching the video. Normal stuff. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.